Today we've got Teresa Torres with us to talk about continuous discovery, the what and why of continuous discovery. And I'm personally really excited because discovery is one of my favorite, favorite topics, one of the most useful things I think anyone can do. Uh, and also a bit special this time, we've got some books to give away at the end for those that ask questions. Um, Teresa's just written this book, Continuous Discovery Habits. So we're just really keen. I'm really keen to talk to Teresa about it today. I hope you are as well. I'm going to just quickly do intro for myself. So I'm the founder and CEO of Terum. We're a product development and strategy firm. We're one of the fastest growing companies in Australia for a while. And look, I've been involved in a lot of major product launches and I love making sausages and sailing boats. The two don't go well together. <laughs> They're separate activities, I should be clear. Maybe they need to be separated in bullet points. Um, and I was just learning from Teresa that, Teresa, you're a keen outdoors woman, mountain biking, backcountry skiing. And I did start getting a bit jealous because I know that the snow you'd be hanging out in is a thousand times better than we get down in Australia. So anyway, I'll, I'll, we'll get over there once once the borders are all open and we can fly around, we'll get over there for a ski. Welcome, I'm gonna hand over to you. Perfect, thank you so much. Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny that you say our snow is much better because I really want to get out. First of all, I've never been to Australia. Yeah. Uh, I was planning a trip right before COVID happened. Oh, no way. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to get back pretty soon. Um, although I'm not quite ready to jump on an airplane just yet. Um, but if I do look forward to when we can kind of travel and meet up in person. Yeah, then there's some good, there's some excellent um, mountain biking uh, trails and hikes to go on in Australia. It's different, but there's some, especially in the outback, there's just some amazing scenes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to get out there at some point. So, okay. discovery. Yeah, yeah. So today I want to talk a little bit about the what and why of continuous discovery. Um, Scott, I know you're excited to get to kind of the conversation and the Q&A. So I'm going to try to give a shorter talk than I initially planned. Um, so if it feels a little bit rushed, what I'm going to tell you is that everything that I'm going to cover in the talk is in the book. And really, um, my goal with the book was to give you a hands-on reference guide that uh, that gives you tips that you could put into practice tomorrow. And so I know it's really easy to be inspired by a talk and wanna go do it, and then you get stuck. So if that happens, if you leave today really inspired and you wanna try some of these methods, and if you do get stuck, just know that the book is meant to help you walk you through that. So that's sort of my initial pitch on why you should win a free copy of the book tonight. <laughs> And well, can I just say, so I've, I've been reading the book after you released it, I got a copy straight away and started reading it. Um, and there's a lot of detail in there that around the nuance of some of the techniques and everything that's great. Like, and, and, and it is a fantastic reference guide to walk people through discovery. It, it, yeah, I've got a lot out of reading it. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, so what I would like to do today is just, I'm gonna introduce at a high level, the framework that I cover in the book. Um, I know when I give a talk like this, a lot of the value is in people asking about the specific obstacles and challenges that they're facing. So I do want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Um, over the course of the talk, if you have questions, pop them in that Q&A window, um, and Scott and I will tackle them in just a little bit. Okay, for the, so for those of you that um, are not familiar with my work, um, my name is Teresa Torres. I work as a product discovery coach. I've been really fortunate in that I've gotten to work with teams all over the world, including in Melbourne and Sydney. Um, a big part of the reason why I like to share this at the beginning of this talk is because the last thing we need is more people with opinions about how a product should work. And I wanna share that this talk is not just, hey, here's Teresa's way of doing discovery, but it really is something that was co-created with a lot of teams in a lot of different contexts. Um, and that really I see my job is just how do I collect the best practices and share them broader so that we can all start to learn from each other um, and really get better at what we do. Um, so that's um, the first thing I'll share. For those of you that might be thinking what in the world is discovery, I always like to start at the beginning and just really simplify things. Um, I define discovery as the 
I actually stole this definition from Marty Kagan. He defines discovery as um, all the things that we do when deciding what to build. We often talk about this in contrast to delivery, which is all the things that we're doing um, to build, uh, ship, and maintain a production quality product. The reason why this is an important distinction, it's not that these are two completely separate areas of work. They often interweave and are interconnected. It's that a lot of companies put a huge emphasis on delivery and we often underemphasize discovery. And so what we're seeing over the last say five to 15 years is a shift towards getting more deliberate, more intentional about how we're doing our discovery work. The other shift that we're seeing is that a lot of us grew up in a project world where we started to adopt discovery from a project mindset. And what I'm gonna to talk today about is a continuous mindset and why that matters so much. Um, and I know from working with a lot of teams that most of the teams that come into my coaching start out with, Teresa, we're already doing continuous discovery. We just need you to help us fine tune. And while it's true that those teams are doing discovery activities on a regular basis, many teams are still adopting the activities from a project mindset. So a project mindset is we kick off a project, we interview a bunch of customers, maybe we put together a nice shiny research report, we socialize it, we make a bunch of decisions, maybe we do some usability testing, and then we ship it off to delivery. A continuous mindset is more fluid than that. The key idea is how do we infuse more of our decisions with feedback along the way, not just at the beginning, not just at the end, but continuously as we work, and also acknowledging that products are not projects. Digital products are never done, they're always evolving. So the second thing I wanna do is really just share my definition of continuous discovery. And then we're gonna spend most of our time just talking through this definition and giving you a clear benchmark to aspire to. So I define continuous discovery as at a minimum, weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product where they're conducting small research activities in pursuit of a desired product outcome. Now this is a mouthful, we're gonna break it down. So let's start with why do we need to engage with customers every week? Product teams are making decisions every day. Some of them are big strategic decisions like which customers should we serve? What opportunities do we go after? What outcomes are we trying to drive? Others are more just uh, pedestrian everyday decisions like what do we label this button? Or how do we expose this feature in the interface? Or what should the underlying data model look like, right? But those smaller decisions and medium-sized decisions, it's still important to get feedback from our customers. And a lot of this is because product teams have um, a bias called the curse of knowledge. We understand our products inside and out. We know how the data model works. We know how the interface works. We know where everything is. We know what all the functionality is. And we forget that our customers don't have that same knowledge. And so as we go about our days, as we're making all these small to medium to large decisions, we're making them from our viewpoint instead of from our customer's viewpoint. And so one of the best ways to counteract the curse of knowledge, where it's hard for us to imagine our customer's perspective because they have less knowledge about the product than we do, an easy way around this is just to engage with customers on a weekly basis. You're gonna introduce some serendipity into the process. You're gonna start talking with customers. You're gonna start to be much more aware of the gap about how you think about your product and how your customers think about the product. And the more that you can see that gap, the more you're gonna be motivated to do things to try to close that gap. The other advantage of this continuous cadence is that we often do research from a validation mindset where we're validating our designs when we're done. We're evaluate, validating which problems we're solving after we made the decision. If we engage with customers regularly, we're actually gonna to talk to them when we only have a half-baked idea, when we're not sure which problems to solve. Um, and it's gonna open the door to more of what I call a co-creation mindset, where we get feedback from customers much earlier in the process. We're in a much better position to integrate that feedback. We're, we don't have engineers sitting, waiting for the next thing. So there's no time to iterate, but we're actually gonna work with them from the very beginning, which means we're gonna close that gap between how we think and how they think. And we're gonna be much more likely to integrate more of their feedback. So that's just this first line, just as simple as why is this continuous cadence important? We're just trying to stay close to our customers, close the gap between what we know and what they know, and make sure that we're getting feedback on more of those daily decisions. Yeah. Ter Teresa, how do yeah. you find like, 
Um, I definitely see a lot of nervousness with teams of all shapes and sizes with talking to their customers regularly. I don't, I don't want to bug them. I don't want to, um, I don't want to get in their way or like my ideas aren't formed enough. I don't want to take them to them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll okay. We'll talk about some of these things when we get into the second half of this decision, yeah, we'll yeah. talk this definition, we'll talk a lot about what do these research activities look like? What are we doing? What are we asking in interviews? What types of people should we be talking to? Um, so can I hold off on answering that? Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. All right, um, so let's dive into this second line. So by the team building the product, what do I mean by the team? It starts with this idea of a product trio. A, a, a product trio is typically comprised of a product manager, a designer, and an engineer. I saw I some, will say, fun, some fun Twitter discussions around all the inclusions you yeah, left out. Yeah, so <laughs> and I yeah, will yeah. say, since releasing the book, I've been hammered by UX writers, content marketers, product marketing managers, program managers, project managers, data analysts, data science, everybody who doesn't have one of these three titles and they're feeling left out. So I wanna be really clear, the idea of a product trio is not meant to be exclusion, exclusionary. This is the team that is leading your discovery initiative. They're not doing, they're not necessarily making all of the decisions in isolation. They're not doing all the discovery work in isolation. This is the team that is um, your, the minimum cross-functional team that's required to build a good digital product. This idea can flex, right? So at most companies, we see these three roles represented. We're not totally there yet. Some people don't have full-time designers on their team. Some people, people don't have um, persistent partners, right? They're mixing teams up project to project, but we're getting a lot closer to this core idea of these three roles um, collaborating and, and, together. And I might just add, like, I've, I've seen examples where, say, there's some really strong subject matter expertise that you need around something. Like, for instance, if you've got a product and the, the user of it is an accountant, like maybe it's got some tax, complex tax in there then actually in the trio, you want to expand it to a, a quad a quad, and include yep. the, include an accountant in the team because they, they, you know, you need the subject matter or in another situation, a, a product for, um, I know in the book, you've got an example of a product for pets. Uh, the, you know, I've seen one where there's, you got to do with health. You might want to include a vet in the, in the team or yep. a, a dog nutritionist or something. So yeah, it's really don't, don't, I think as, as Twitter has shown, don't take it too strictly. Think about who's the core, but you definitely need these roles in there. Yeah, so here's what I'll say. Most of us have lots of people on our team besides the trio, right? We have more than one engineer. Depending on your DevOps strategy, you might still have QA people on your team. Depending on how you interface with the rest of the business, you might have a customer success person, a data analyst. If you're fortunate enough to have a UX writer, which is what my primary Twitter battle was about, God bless you, right? Like I don't, that's amazing. But here's the idea of the trio. It does flex. You want the, the core concept behind the trio is cross-functional collaboration. So given the type of decision that you're trying to make, who needs to be consulted? Who needs to be a part of that decision-making? And then we need to acknowledge that we can't have 17 people in every decision because we won't get anything done. Right, so if you're working on your go-to-market strategy, you probably want to bring that product marketing manager into that discovery work. But maybe your product marketing manager doesn't need to be involved in writing acceptance criteria for user stories, right? So we can kind of flex who's leading discovery based on the type of discovery that we're doing. Um, and this is a really critical piece. So what we're trying to avoid with a, with a trio is handoffs. So in a waterfall model, Stakeholders would sort of set the strategy, product managers would write the requirements, they'd get thrown off over the wall to designers, they'd do the designs, and then the requirements of the design would get thrown over the wall to the engineers and they would build. And what we see with these handoffs is just a ton of rework, right? Each step after the previous one, we find problems, we gotta go back and redo. The idea of the trio is how do we get the right cross-functional roles collaborating from the beginning? And I've coached a lot of teams and I've See, the vast majority of teams, their trio is going to be a product manager, a designer, and an engineer. But I've also seen plenty of exceptions. I've worked with teams where they worked on data projects and they had data scientists instead of UX designers, right? I've worked with teams where 
um, it was a service. There wasn't even a digital product. And so they replaced um, that engineer with um, the person that was fulfilling the service, right? So definitely don't be dogmatic about this idea of a trio. It really is just about cross-functional collaboration. Okay. Oh, just a now, quick one of the, just a yeah. quick on that is who who leads the team. You've got some interesting stuff in the book on that, but just maybe yeah. so you can keep going. Yeah. This is a really important part of the trio is that when our trio is truly a trio, we're talking about the three primary roles required to build a um, a digital product. So a product manager, a designer, and an engineer. There's this question of like, well, how does decision making really work? It is the product manager does that decide is are they the CEO of the product? Okay, first of all, CEOs don't make all the decisions. So that's like a faulty belief, right? This is really intended to be a truly collaborative model, which means they are jointly responsible for decisions. And why this is hard for people to wrap their head around is that most of us have never really truly collaborated. We always fall back to that organizational hierarchy where we escalate something to the decision maker. And so the key to making this work is gonna be all the steps we talk about in the next two lines of the definition, which is what are all the activities these three are doing together? So they're starting from a common ground and they're able to make decisions together rather than falling back to, we have a single decision maker. Okay. And what's really critical here is again, with the trio, we're trying to avoid handoffs. And we also want the whole cross-functional trio to have exposure to customers. Right, so that they're the ones doing their own research. Part, the reason for that is we want them getting fast answers to those daily and weekly questions. There might be other people in the organization that are doing research, that's phenomenal. We can leverage that research, but it's not in lieu of building this, of this tight feedback loop between the product team that's building the product and the customer. So let's get into what's happening when we meet with customers every week. These last two lines of the definition are really intertwined. So we're gonna talk about them together. Um, and it starts with this visual that I introduced in the book. I also introduced it on Product Talk back in like 2016. It's called an Opportunity Solution Tree. My goal with this visual was to help teams visually chart the best path to their desired outcome. So let's start by talking about outcomes and why that's important. So for a lot of us, we grew up in an output world. We're being asked to deliver fixed roadmaps. We're being asked what solutions we're building. We're prioritizing solutions. What we're seeing as an industry is a shift away from dictating specific outputs to, to managing by outcomes. What this shift gives us is a little bit of room for uncertainty. And if we learned anything in 2020, I hope it's that the world is fairly uncertain and the whole landscape can change pretty rapidly, right? But even when we're not going through a global pandemic, Things are constantly changing. We see new competitors enter the market. We see new technologies disrupt what we're doing. We see um, customer behavior shift a little bit based on what's been released lately, right? So the world's constantly changing around us. What we're doing when we shift to an outcome mindset is we're saying, look, we need to experiment our way to finding the right solutions. Whatever those solutions are, we know we need to derive this value for the business. So your outcome is looking at how can your team create value for the business? And then this visual, the opportunity solution tree is gonna help you map out your best path there. Now, of course, we're not just business centric, right? A good product team is also customer centric. And this is where we're gonna introduce this idea of opportunities. So an opportunity is a customer need, a customer pain point or a customer desire. Our goal is to discover the opportunities that if we addressed them would drive our outcome. So we're starting with a business need, we're going out and exploring customer needs and we're looking to align the two. And this is really critical because um, a lot of companies, these are in tension with each other. We can serve the customer, we can serve the business. Whereas a good product team needs to be doing both. I often get asked, why don't we start with the customer need and then look for the business value? Uh, it does sometimes happen in that direction, but usually your business leaders are gonna communicate, here's the business need we need, and the product team is gonna have to look for the customer value. The other thing, the reason why I think it makes sense to start with the business value is that it's really easy to fall into the trap of creating customer value without creating business value. And that puts us on a road to go out of business. The opportunity space is infinite. And so regardless of what the business value is at the top of the tree, 
we can find a customer centric way to it to drive that business value. So this visual will help you align those two things and help you ensure that you're creating both business value and customer value. And then of course, we have to move into the solution space eventually, so we have something to build. So we're gonna look at how do we discover the solutions that will address those opportunities in a way that will drive our outcome. So we're gonna start with, you gotta set an outcome. In an ideal world, this is a negotiation between you and your product, your C-level product executive. So this could be your chief product officer, your VP of product. Um, and the reason why it's important that it be a two-way negotiation is that leader needs to communicate the business value that could always be changing. So they're gonna say in this moment in time, this is the business value we need you to create. And then your product trio is uh, communicating how much can get done in what time frame, And not from an output standpoint, but from an impact on the out, not from an output standpoint, but from an impact on the outcome standpoint. Once we have that in place, what we wanna be doing is we wanna start interviewing to discover opportunities. So Scott, one of the things you asked was, what do I do in an interview if I don't have any solution ideas? So we really want to not talk about solutions in our interviews at all and really spend the time talking about our customer's context, our customer's lives, our customer needs, um, and do this on a continuous basis. Now, the reason why, sorry, I'm getting, the sun is moving and I'm getting some crazy sun, but hopefully it's okay. Um, so one of the reasons why teams don't do this more frequently is because frankly, it's just hard to recruit people on a weekly basis, right? Recruiting customers to talk to is a chore in and of itself. Most of us do project-based research. We spend a couple weeks recruiting. We interview for a couple weeks. We can't squeeze this down into a one week activity. So what I recommend is that you automate the recruiting process. Here's your goal. You wanna show up to work on Monday and there's already an interview on your calendar and you did not have to do a single thing to get it there. I'm gonna briefly share three ways to do this. If you want more details on these methods, they are detailed, um, they're included in detail in the book. The first is you can recruit people while they're using your product or service. So you've probably seen sites that do this. It's just a quick interstitial. You show it through to a percentage of people. You make it really easy for them to opt in. That's great for consumer companies or for B2B companies that have a, where people are working out of the product all day, every day, or fairly frequently. Second thing you can do is you can have your customer facing teams help you recruit. So you can define triggers. If you're talking to a customer that has this need, I'd like to talk to them. So this is your sales teams, your account management teams, your customer support teams. Um, this is really great for B2B context and especially if um, you need to interview people that are not always in your product. Now for some really hard to reach audiences, you may need to go a step further and set up a customer advisory board. The key here is if you pursue this strategy is to not do a focus group with the whole board, but still work with them one-on-one. -on -one. So you're still doing one-on-one -on -one interviews. And um, Teresa, just, just, there's a question that's kind of relevant in, so, someone's asked, um, we have customer success people or customer support people. Can we that talk to our customers every day? C can we uh, speak to them instead of our customers? Um, I think like, I'll let you answer the, I think it's just relevant to this bit, like we're yeah. addressing here that the interview, my interpretation of what you've written is um, the interview has got to be with the customer and it's the, it's the product trio chatting to a genuine customer, not so much a proxy conversation. Yeah, so again, our goal is we're trying to close the gap between how we think about our product and how our customers think about our product. If you stick a customer facing coworker in the middle there, now you have two gaps you have to cover. And actually it's probably a permit, a combination of, it's probably more than two, right? Because there's the gap between you and your customer facing colleague, there's the gap between them and your customer. And then there's the misinterpretation as we get sort of this telephone game as one person interprets the other person. We can reduce that complexity by just having the product team talk directly with a customer. The other challenge there is that product teams work on a really different cadence than most people in the company. We're trying to ship value every week. We have teeny tiny questions we need to get fast answers to. And it's gonna be really hard to get your customer facing teams who have their own jobs to do to go get you fast answers every single week. And uh, I was gonna say that the, my experience of tr trying this in some instances is that the, the 
skill of interviewing someone in the way that you're talking about, Teresa, for discovery or just for discovery in general, it's a very specific skill. And like, I've seen excellent salespeople completely bias a customer when they're trying to do an interview because they're just naturally <laughs> closing the deal yeah. and you just get really not great discovery insights for the product. So I think it's the, the skill of interviewing is it, it's a skill unto itself. Um, and it's a different type of conversation to what your support or sales people will be having. But yeah, I'll let, I'll let you keep going. Definitely. So we're actually going to get into, okay, so we've got a customer in the room. What are we asking them? And this is a big part of the reason why the team needs to be do their, doing their own interviewing. Our primary goal is to avoid speculation. And this is a skill that needs to be developed. So what do I mean by speculation? I'll tell you a quick story. In a workshop that I was doing, I asked a woman to volunteer and to tell me what her criteria was for buying a pair of blue jeans. She was very confident in her answer. She said, fit is my number one criteria. Um, I then asked her, tell me about the last time you bought a pair of jeans. And she said, oh, it was just about a month ago. I bought a pair of jeans on Amazon. And I said, oh, you bought jeans on Amazon. Tell me how you figured out if they would fit. And she said, well, I bought a brand that I had bought before. And for those of you that have a hard time finding jeans that fit, you, this question might, might resonate. I asked her, have you ever bought a pair of jeans from the same brand and they fit differently? And she laughed and said, yes. And so I said, why, so why did you buy your pair of jeans on Amazon? And she said, because I got a good deal. So here's what happened. When I asked her, how do you buy a pair? What's your number one criteria for buying a pair of jeans? She speculated about her own behavior. Now, she's not abnormal. All humans are terrible at speculating about our own behavior. We don't do the work required to like take an inventory of all the times we bought jeans and think through what am I really doing. Our, ants, our brains, because we are susceptible to cognitive biases, come up with really fast answers and they sound believable. Fit is a perfectly good criteria for buying a pair of jeans. Right up until the point you're faced with the convenience and the good deal of online shopping, right? Suddenly those criteria trump a good fit. And so it's not that she's being misleading and it's not, she's, everybody hears this and they go, oh, I would never be that way. I promise you in a five minute conversation, I can find a gap between what you think you do and what you actually do. And this is our challenge for product people. We don't wanna build products based on what people think they do. We wanna build products based on what people actually do. So we need to avoid speculative questions. And the, easy way to, the easiest way to do this is to spend your interview time collecting specific stories about actual behavior. So instead of saying, what type of criteria do you use when buying a pair of jeans? Tell me about the last time you bought a pair of jeans and I'm gonna listen for what criteria were a factor, right? And because it's grounded in a specific instance, the, the response is gonna be a lot more reliable. As we do this, as we collect customer stories, we're going to start to be able to, we're going to start hearing customer needs, customer pain points, customer desires. Those are those opportunities that are the green boxes on this visual. Now, this is the simplest opportunity solution tree you'll ever see when you do it in practice. It'll be sprawling and big and messy, and that's totally normal. Um, the goal here is to get a big picture view of all the needs, pain points, and desires that you could address to reach your desired outcome. And then we want to set up what I call a good compare and contrast decision. I'm gonna skip through this a little bit just in the interest of time. But the idea here, the key idea is I want you working with sets of solutions that address the same opportunity. And the reason for this is this is a concept that researchers, um, that decision-making researchers talk about. We wanna avoid whether or not decisions, should we build this idea or not? It leads to confirmation bias and it leads to us falling in love with our ideas. We become blind to the flaws. If we instead set up a good compare and contrast decision, we're asking a different question, which is which of these ideas looks most promising. That one change, working with sets of ideas for the same target opportunity, will dramatically improve your discovery work. I think that this is one of the almost harder ones for teams, including myself. I'm guilty of this one often to, to, to come with because you kind of you see an opportunity, you start thinking and you form the solution in your head and you like, we're all, it's just human nature. You're like, oh, I've, I've solved it. I know how we're going to address this opportunity. And so you just kind of then run headlong into your preferred 
opportunity and often never get to the other sorry solution and then never get yeah. to it. it's like it's one of the hard especially for you know f folks in in product teams engineers that kind of thing we love like we're in the businesses that we're in because we love solving problems and building solutions and so it's a really hard one to distance get that ego away from it a bit and kind of be like no i'm gonna i'm gonna pause i know i've designed a great one but i'm gonna try and design another great solution i think it's one of the more challenging ones to overcome yeah this is the this is this is one of the hardest things to do in fact one of the best habits to develop is to just start asking the question what else should we consider this is true for outcomes this is true for opportunities this is true for solutions it's actually true in li in life like forget product stuff it's also true in life i use these methods just in my regular life i'll share that um Back in 2015, I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was thinking about where to live. I, I wanted to leave the Bay Area. I considered four cities, and I actually spent time in all four cities before deciding where to live. Um, and again, it was the same idea of like, this feels like a big permanent decision. How do I test my way there? How do I compare and contrast? How do I make sure that I'm making a better decision? Um, it's a mindset, right? You definitely have to cultivate and develop the mindset. So how do you it's great that we're developing this mindset as 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 in this webinar and and that and as product people but then my observation is often it's like then you take it back to the back to the exec <laughs> you know you've got a solution and they're like great go for it run after that thing whether culturally structurally budget wise whatever how do you bring that conversation back to the to the um to the team to say we've, we've got to try multiple solutions because you often get we don't have the budget for multiple pick one yeah so this is a perfect segue to where we're heading to so what, the biggest reason why teams don't explore multiple solutions is because the way they're testing solutions today is too heavy-handed we don't have time to a b test three solutions i do not recommend doing that we don't have time to prototype in depth all three solutions and get to do weeks of design work and weeks of um, testing with customers. So the key here is we have to take our solutions and break them down into the underlying assumptions and do rapid assumption testing. And what's good about assumption testing is most assumption tests we can run in an hour or two or a day or two at most. Um, and I'll walk through some examples of this. But I also think to your question, Scott, you got to use your, each product trio has to decide when to surface what work to stakeholders. So you may not ever tell your stakeholders you're considering three solutions. You might do your assumption testing first and present your final solution if they don't have a lot of appetite for comparing and contrasting. If they have really strong opinions about what you should build, you might surface that compare and contrast earlier on so they can start to get see the results of your assumption testing. And so this is where everybody has to do the work to really know who their stakeholders are and what they need and where to bring them into the process. Um, but what your stakeholders are asking for doesn't necessarily have to limit what you individually can do. You just need to make sure you can work on their timeline. Okay, so to talk through how do we identify and test assumptions, I'm going to walk through a really simple example. Um, always when I'm speaking um, to an audience that's not in the US, I have to do a little bit of translation for this example, but I think it will work. So you can give me some feedback on how I'm doing on this. I want you to imagine that we work at Netflix, we've interviewed customers, an opportunity that comes up over and over again. And if you're not a Netflix user, pick any streaming entertainment company. Um, what comes up over and over again is I wanna watch sports, right? So I'm a big sports fan, I'm a Netflix subscriber, Netflix doesn't have any sports, right? So maybe you interview me and you hear this need of like, I really wanna watch live sports. I don't have a cable account anymore. It's hard to do that. So we, we know we should have a compare and contrast. We generate three solutions and we come up with three different options. The first is we could integrate local TV channels into the Netflix subscription. So here in the US, we have three primary local networks, ABC, uh, CBS and NBC. A lot of our sports leagues have games on those channels. So this is just one way to integrate um, sports into Netflix. Uh, the second option is we could just um, uh, partner with our different sports leagues. So here it would be Major League Baseball and the National Hockey League. Um, in Europe, it might be Premier League. Uh, in Australia, maybe it's your Rugby League. Um, and we would license the games directly. 
right? And have the games just show up in Netflix just like any other movie. It'd be Australian football if it was here. Australian so football. I just need okay. To be super clear, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the third option would be look, we're Netflix. We're not in the sports business. Let's just partner with somebody else who is really good at sports. So Fubu, Fubo TV is a streaming service that's pretty good at sports. Maybe we just bundle Netflix. Your Netflix subscription comes with a Fubo TV subscription. So three very different solutions. We're not going to A-B test all of these, right? Because it involves a lot of business development and partnerships and technical integration. So how might we test some of these solutions? The first thing we need to do is identify our assumptions. So assumptions come in all kinds of categories. Um, we have desirability assumptions. Does anyone want it? We have viability assumptions. Is it worth it for our business to build it? We have feasibility assumptions. Is it possible? Um, we have usability assumptions. Can people find it? Do they understand it? Are they able to do what we need them to do? And we have ethical assumptions. Is there any potential harm um, in building this solution? This fifth category we often neglect. I think it's critically important. Um, and I go into a lot of detail in the book on how you can start to uncover ethical assumptions. One of the best ways you can surface assumptions is to story map your ideas. So if you're not familiar with story mapping, it's really simple. You just map out step by step. Here's what needs to happen for the customer to get value from this idea. Now, I want to be really clear. We're not story mapping how to build the solution. We're assuming the solution already exists, and we're just story mapping what does the customer have to do. So in this instance, we're integrating local channels. The customer has to decide to watch the game. They have to choose a streaming service. They have to open that streaming service. They have to find a local channel and they have to watch that local channel. Now, below the story map, I'm starting to surface assumptions by asking what has to be true in order for this step to happen, right? So in order for my customer to decide to watch the game, they have to wanna watch sports. In order for the customer to choose our ser streaming service, they have to know that they can watch the game on our streaming service. They have to want to. They have to want to watch it on our streaming service, um, and they have to be able to find our service. And honestly, I could generate dozens more assumptions just from this very simple story map. Um, under the find a local channel, they have to know what channel the sport is on, right? A lot of us, when we go to Netflix, we're used to just searching for a movie title. In this instance, you'd have to know, hey, the game's on NBC. Right, so we're just generating assumptions. I can do the same. Um, yeah, so I wanna start for this sake of this example, we're gonna just start with this very first assumption, subscribers wanna watch sports. And the reason why I'm starting there is because all three ideas depend on it. Now I have other assumptions that will distinguish my three ideas, but I wanna first start with the ones that are shared, make sure I'm working on the right opportunity, once I've done that, I can then iterate and work on the assumptions that distinguish my ideas from each other. But if I want to test this assumption, subscribers want to watch sports, I'm going to give you four ways to quickly test assumptions. The first is a one question survey. So I don't actually have to build anything to test this assumption. I can ask my customers, have you watched a sporting event in the past week? Yes or no. Now, notice that I did not say, do you watch sports? That is a speculative question. If you watched uh, Australian um, rules football game five years ago, you might answer the question, yes. But you're probably not a sports viewer from my definition of, are you gonna care that I added sports to Netflix? So I wanna phrase my question just like I'm interviewing. I wanna ask about specific instances in the past. Have you watched a sporting event in the last week? If I'm Netflix, I could build this right into the home screen, let people give a thumbs up or a thumbs down from the remote control. If I'm a web-based service, I can do a little pop-up right in the product while people are using it. If I send out an email newsletter, I could do a little one-question survey in my newsletter. One-question surveys are a super fast way to collect a lot of feedback very quickly. Second way I could test this assumption, my customers might already be exhibiting behavior that suggests they wanna watch sports. In this Netflix example, maybe people are already searching for sports. So I could actually look at my search queries and say, do we already have customers who are looking for sports? Both of these ways of testing, whether it's a one question survey or looking at our search queries can be done in a couple hours, right? We're not taking days to test this assumption. Now, um, I actually skipped the first one. I'm gonna go back to it really quickly. I could prototype, do a very simple prototype to test this assumption. 
where I just show people a screen of here's some things to watch and ask them, what do you want to watch? If some of them are sports, some of them are movies, some of them are TV shows, I would expect some percentage of them to choose sports if they want to watch sports. Now, some of your assumptions are going to be feasibility assumptions. Really, the easiest way to test these is just to do a research spike and to set some goals and to see what you learn in that time period. The goal here across all three of our ideas is we're not building a lot. We're not designing a lot. We're taking the time to story map so that we can see our assumptions. We're, we're running assumption tests that we can run in a couple hours, in a day or two, so that we can then compare and contrast our solutions against each other. This is really what unlocks that continuous cadence. It's decision-making research supports this. It's gonna help you make much better decisions about what to build, and you'll increase your hit rate of what ends up in your backlog. Okay, we just covered a lot of ground and there's a lot of detail behind this framework that we didn't get a chance to get into, but I'm seeing there's a ton of questions. So I'm sure we can dive in with the questions. And then afterwards I will share, um, I do, I do wanna highlight this book did come out on May 19th. It should be broadly available. I just saw that Amazon launched print on demand in Australia. So if you were having a hard time getting a hold of the paperback, it should now be much easier to get in Australia. Scott you, can had ask, no... you can just ask questions. We got five to give away. Yeah, or you can ask questions <laughs> and win one tonight. Um, but this really is designed to be a hands-on guide to help you work through your way through this process and adopt these habits. And it, and it, it, it I should say, so I was saying at the start, I've, I've read most of the book now and the um, it really works through a lot of the nuance that Teresa hasn't been able to cover. So for instance, the opportunity tree, I saw someone said, hey, this looks great. I haven't seen this before. Teresa really works through how to start moving your opportunity tree items around and also how to organize your opportunity tree and work through it. And there's some, some really good, um, just really practical uh, advice and thinking in there on how, how to work through an opportunity tree, for instance. And same with behind the, all the other things Teresa's covered, there's a lot more practical detail to help you work it through. So it's, yeah. Definitely recommend it if you're doing discovery. Cool, let's do let's do questions. I think what we're gonna have to do, there's quite a few and we may run out of time. So I think we're gonna have to take it on the basis of top rated uh, the votes. So if you can see the Q and A, everyone, you can vote for questions. We're kind of gonna have to go by most, most popular. Um, and I'm gonna start at the top, which is, how does continuous customer discovery work in practice for B2B products? Um, yeah. And I think, I think where that's going is just the challenge of getting in front of people. You covered it a little bit, but I'll let you cover it some more. Yeah, so I, I often get questions about, hey, this sounds great if I worked at B2C and I could just go to a Starbucks and talk to any customer. Does it really work in a B2B environment? So I will say the vast majority of teams that I've worked with work in B2B environments. I think these methods work equally well in both contexts. There are some differences to take into account in B2B environments. First of all, you probably have more than just end users. You also have buyers whose needs you got to take into account. So from an interviewing standpoint, you need to make sure that you're understanding the opportunity space for your buyers as well as for your end users. It can be a little bit harder to get in touch with enterprise clients sometimes. Right. So with consumer, maybe everybody's a customer, but most of us are not that passionate about our consumer experiences. Like, I don't really care that much about the 17,000 products I use in my personal life, but the software that I use for work is much more impactful on my day to day life because I use it every day and it has a big impact on my business. So sometimes B2B users will give you more of their time because it's part of their job and they actually want your software to work better for them. So this, it's easy to assume this is gonna be easier for consumers. I actually see it's often easier for enterprise. The other huge advantage, which we touched on a little bit earlier, is that if you're in a B2B company, you have customer facing colleagues that can help you recruit. So um, partner with your sales reps and your customer support rep, reps and your account managers. And don't, if you do that, don't turn it into a big project. Like don't go to your VP of sales and say, hey, you need to help us get all these people for our product teams. Because the sales rep is going to be like, no, I don't. I have to sell. 
Um, instead, just start small, like find a person in the company that you have a good relationship with. Ask if you can sit in on one of their meetings, help them get comfortable with the types of things you want to ask. And then as they get comfortable, iterate from there. Be like, okay, now can you help me schedule my own meetings? Um, so I don't think there's a giant difference between B2B and B2C other than some of the nuances are a little bit different. And, and just to expand on that, um, what about B2B to C? Yeah, it's a similar <laughs> idea, right? So B2B to C is not that different from B2B to end user. Um, you've probably just got a bit more of like, you're going to have to interview the business that's involved in the loop as well as the consumer. You just, yep. you've just got that extra level of, of interviews so you can really understand the journeys and all that kind of thing. Um, yep. All right, so we got one book's going to Claire because she's got the two top questions, um, which is awesome. There you go, Claire, you've got a book. Uh, let's do the next, next question, which is top voted from Claire, which is one of the biggest challenges I find is influencing organizations to pursue customer discovery when they believe they already understand their customers, but actually haven't yeah. spoken to any of them directly. <laughs> Yeah, so I get a lot of questions that start with, how do I convince somebody in the organization to, to let me work this way, right? And that somebody could be your boss, it could be a key stakeholder, it could be your sales team, whoever it is. That's what I wrote down as my top question for you. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I don't think you should try to convince anybody of anything, personally. I think you're going to bang your head against the wall. I think especially if you're trying to convince someone more senior to you in the organizational hierarchy, you're, you're going to have a hard time with that. And that's because how they've worked has gotten them, gotten them to where they are. And there's not a lot of motivation for them to try new things yet. So your job is to create the motivation. And here's how you can do that. Really focus on what's within your control. So you probably do have a way of talking to a customer, even if you work in an organization where you're not allowed to talk to customers, right? You probably can make friends with a single account manager, or you could probably start reading support tickets, or maybe you have someone that matches the similar behavior as your customer in your own personal network, right? So I, I really encourage you to take a continuous improvement mindset, start in the smallest, easiest place that you can, and then iterate from there. And the reason why I recommend this is even if you're being handed a fixed roadmap and you have no control over any discovery decisions, if you start talking to customers, if you start understanding the opportunity space, if you start developing your own outcome mindset, you will build better versions of the outputs on that roadmap. And as you build better versions of things, your stakeholders are gonna get curious about how are you getting such good results? And that's when you can start talking about, oh, well, I'm talking to customers and I'm testing assumptions and I'm doing all these things. So I would look for what's in, within your control. How do you start to change your own behavior and wait for people to come to you with how are you getting such great results? That is one of the best answers I've heard to this question, Teresa. Thanks for that one. Um, it comes from it comes from at least a <laughs> half, if not more, of trying to change people's minds. I was going to say failing. you you've sat there having to try and convince a lot of people in this going, You know what? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just going to do it my <laughs> way. <laughs> awesome. All right, the next one from Albert. Alberto, regarding customer interviews, can you interview the same group of customers multiple times? What's the downside? You can. So I've worked with companies um, that where, for example, I worked with a company whose customers were Canadian medical schools. There are not hundreds of medical schools in Canada. They were concerned about going to the same customers over and over again. And so what did they do? They started to set up long-term relationships where they interviewed the same schools on a regular cadence. The downside to this, so the upside of it is you get a sense for how needs and pain points evolve over time. So you get to learn a customer's context in depth. The downside of this is that if your, cust if your market is big and you're only talking to a handful of customers, you run the risk that the customers you're talking to don't represent your market. So you just need to be careful. In fact, what I recommend is that you mix and match, that you have some customers that you build long um, deeper relationships with and you have other customers that you're talking to periodically to just increase the variation of customers that you're talking to. Awesome. Um, next one is from Dawn. 
Do you see any common division of responsibilities when it comes to research by a UX researcher or the product team? What's your thinking here? And then yeah, this is I'll throw another one in just to just to add to it is UX researcher product team. The other one I see a lot is strategy team kind of sitting over in the ivory tower and handing yep. down um, there's a big macro opportunity in e-commerce. Go go forth and discover. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So this user researcher question is actually the next question I'm going to answer in this video series that I've been creating. So um, I'll give you the I'll give you the preview of it. So um, a lot of companies are investing in user research, and that's awesome. And if you have a user researcher team and your product teams are doing continuous discovery, there's still room for everybody. Um, and there's a few patterns that I, I'm seeing in how this works. One is a lot of centralized teams, whether it's a strategy team or a user research team, are tackling longer horizon research projects. So if you remember, a product team is trying to ship value every week. We're making daily and weekly um, decisions that we want customer feedback on. Our centralized research teams can ask longer horizon questions. We can ask those bigger, more strategic questions that might need project research. So it's not that project research is bad, right? We still need project research for some types of questions. It's that product teams need continuous research. So if you have access to project research from these other teams, use it, integrate it into your work. Just don't do it in lieu of doing your own discovery as well. Um, the second way that user researchers tend to get used in a world where the, all the product teams are doing continuous discovery, if you have enough of them, you can embed them on your in your product trios. So you can have quads where the fourth person is a user researcher. And what's great about that is the reliability of your discovery is gonna go way up because your user researcher should be able to help you with the reliability of your research methods. Most of us don't have enough user researchers to embed one on every team. Um, and that's where sometimes that centralized research team Maybe a user researcher has to support three teams. Here's what we don't want to have happen. We don't want them to be a bottleneck. So instead of them doing all of the research for the three teams, because they're going to slow the teams down, they can just act as a consultant where they're advising their three teams on research as they're available. Um, and I think a lot of companies mix and match those methods. So there's plenty of room for user researchers. I think in an ideal world, every product trio would have one embedded with them. Um, until we get there, there's always a purpose for longer horizon research and there's always a need for um, just help and advice on how to do research well. Oh, Scott, I lo lost your audio. Yeah, I went on mute. There we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, standard video call stuff. Uh, <laughs> so from Gabrielle, the question is, how can we fit the agile coach scrum master role into that vision of the trio, where do they sit? What do they do? Do they exist at yeah. all? Yeah, this is a good question. So this question confuses me a little bit, even though I've seen it in practice, so I get why I get asked it. In my experience working on Scrum teams, our Scrum master was always an engineer. Like my interpretation of Scrum is that Scrum was not a full-time job. It was a role that an engineer played, and it was part of engineers taking responsibility for delivery. I realized that with time, that role has morphed and that now teams have full-time scrum masters. I, when I've seen that, usually they're like a um, project manager that's been converted to a scrum master or a program manager that's been converted to a scrum master. Um, I don't have an easy answer for this because I feel like that role means so many different things to different companies. So I think the key um, to answering this question for yourself and for your own context is to think about the types of decisions you're going to make in discovery and which 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 of those decisions that person needs to be a part of and make sure you're including them for those decisions I think, so I yeah know, go ahead yeah just the, the bit that I, I would maybe add to what you're saying is often I think they it is a, a project manager a delivery manager um what that for some reason people don't like project the, the word project manager anymore yeah um even though there's a lot of great stuff that project managers do. I think the, the key one would be the making sure that the scrum master isn't there kind of representing the engineers and that it's an engineer representing the engineers and an engineer that's close yeah. to the technical side. Because too often I've seen um, a non-technical scrum master representing 
the engineering team in these types of conversations. So I think it's a, yeah. That latter point is really important. So people ask me all the time, does it have to be my tech lead? It doesn't have to be your tech lead, but whoever is in your product trio should be able to make decisions about what should be built without being overruled by the other engineers. So there's a little bit of this authority to be part of the decision-making team. So if, for example, your tech lead's like, look, I'm the system architect. I wanna just be in the technical details. I don't really care what we build. I want somebody else to be on the, on the trio. That's fine. But then that tech lead is, is absolving their right to, to come in and dictate what types of things are being decided in discovery. All right, so we've got we've got about three minutes. We'll see if we can do three questions in three minutes. Does that <laughs> should we rapid do? fire? Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. So um, from Nuno, you're focusing more on interviews. What about job shadowing? Yeah. Okay. So observing people um, in their workplace, at their home, doing whatever it is that is the relevant activity for your product or service is amazing. You will learn so much in a very short period of time. The reason why I talk about interviewing as the primary way to discover opportunities is because it's something you can sustainably do week over week. There are very few contexts in which you can observe a customer week over week. If you're in one of those contexts, by all means do it, Okay. right? So so if you're like, like if you're, I know, oh, sorry, rapid fire. Yeah, yeah, we're rapid, Second yeah, one. yeah. Um, all right, so next one from Beck. How and when do you involve your BA in the discovery process? Yeah, so again, that title, the business analyst roles is really different in a lot of different places. If by business analyst, you mean the person who's managing the backlog, doing your, your um, sprint planning meetings and a lot of your scrum rituals. Um, again, I think the key in this whole idea is we want to avoid handoffs. So you want to be, as, as your team is learning and discovery, you want to make sure you're constantly communicating with the entire rest of the team, what you're learning, what decisions that you're making, so that you're not getting this like big lump handoff um, as you're preparing for your next sprint. All right. And next one is from Katarina. What if you discover a need or opportunity that's really important? fits the product vision, but you can't pursue right now due to tech debt or feasibility. How do you handle that given like, yeah, maybe it's gonna address the outcome or and the customer's need? Yeah, I actually think this is a really good thing to happen. I'm having some sun issues, I apologize. A really good thing to happen. So um, uh, it forces the issue, right? If you can have a big picture view of the opportunity space and you can estimate the impact on your outcome, and you have assumption testing to support that, your organization is going to be in a much better position to make a decision about tackling that tech debt or going after those harder problems. A big part of the reason why we shy away from those types of decisions now is because we don't have enough data to have confidence it's the right way to go. So I really encourage teams to push feasibility off, like really focus on business value and customer value. And if it turns out the best solution is going to take time, Make sure that you test enough assumptions to be confident that it really is going to have the impact that you think. And you'll be surprised at how often you can convince the organization to make the investment that they should. Yeah, because it almost gives you the upper limit for your budget and your time frame. Yep. It's like we can spend yep. this much fixing it. We can, if the, if the opportunity is worth $20 million a year to us, then we can spend 10 fixing the tech debt. Yep. We could probably spend 20. Um, cool. And I think we've got time for one. We'll just do one more, and then we're gonna have to gonna have to call it. And we'll, we may find a way to get back to the other questions. Um, from Brett, we've got there are marketing and sales teams between our product teams and the customers. How do you? I think I think maybe we covered this a bit before. How do you sell this in a business who's a product organization doesn't have direct access? I think you kind of covered that before, where you said rather than trying to go and do a big project and convince convince everyone scrap convincing VPs of things that they're not convinced of and just go and like polite, I'm going to say this, well, maybe not even politely, just go work around them, find little ways yep. to go and start proving this out, Ign ignore them. Um, all right, we're going to have to call it, a, have you got time for one more, Teresa? And then we'll- Let's do one more. Let's do one more and then we're done. All right, Manish says many times the solution, teams get attached to a solution 
experimenting and chasing changing can cause demotivation how do you do lightweight experimentation i think there's a lot of stuff in the book around some lightweight experiments and around the motivation it's like i think framing it as an experiment versus this is the solution it's just my thoughts over to you teresa yeah so this is where comparing and contrasting is really important that if you really are comparing and contrasting sets of solutions you're going to see that people are going to get less attached to any single solution. If you really focus on testing assumptions before you really dive into solutions, um, you're going to find that you're going to throw out a lot of ideas. That's just the nature of assumption testing. And the more your team gets comfortable throwing away solutions, the less sort of a sticking your heels in opinion battle um, attachment to solutions you're going to see. All right. Well, that's it. We'd love to get through the others. We might, we might find a way to get through them, but Teresa, thank you so much for that. I think the number of questions, the great discussion we've had, it, it just shows how awesome the chat's been. And I think how interested everyone is in continuous discovery. Uh, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun and thanks for all the great questions. No worries. And thank you to everyone for joining us. It's, it's been awesome having you. Thanks for the questions. Look forward to chatting with you next time. Thanks everyone, bye.